All right, well, thank you very much. We are recording, uh, David. So if you want to put your slides into slideshow mode, therefore I'm just letting in four more people. So uh, over to you, looking forward to hearing about your research on happiness and type. So off you go. Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this session. We've got about an hour, and where this session came from was, um, I often think, what, what kind of a session would I like to attend at the BAP conference? And I thought something on Lincoln type and happiness would be good. So then I, and then you think, oh, right, now I'll have to uh, come up with the content. And it, it is something I've been interested in over the last 25 years or so. Um, and I've looked at a lot of research and a lot of the different approaches. So I hope that I'm going to be able to share that with you. I'll, I would, I would be surprised if, if a lot of it's new, uh, this is well known, but hopefully I'm gonna pull it together and, and give you a chance to um, explore your own happiness and then how you might be able to use some of this within your own work with your clients or with your friends and family. The way I'm gonna do this is um, I'm gonna offer everything I promised in the, in the blurb about the session, but that will be, a lot of that will be as slides that you can look at later. Because when I thought about it, to try and do everything in an hour, all seven or nine different aspects to happiness, it was just gonna be too superficial. So I'm gonna try and concentrate on some of the most important themes. And for that, I'm gonna require you to sort of buckle up, strap yourselves in or whatever, get your big boy pants on and get ready to, um, to go through this and join in. And Susan's gonna have a look at the chat function, the, the chat. So if you do have any answers to the questions I throw at you, uh, please put them in and we'll, Susan will try and feed some of, the, uh, the, some of those back to me. And if, you, if anyone did want to speak, then please do, but just try not to waffle on too much. Uh, I feel free to, okay? if you use the raised hands icon, it's either in the participant list or it's on the reactions um, button. I mean, you've already got some answers to your first question, David, before you've even placed it. So when you're ready for me to well, share those, let me know. Okay, great. Okay, yeah, I thought I'd start off with a, a silly, naughty question. So which type is the happiest? What, what answers have we got? We've got ESFJ, ESFP, ENFJ, two votes for ESFP, extroverted sensing, um, ENTP, doesn't it depend on how we define happiness, ESFP, lots of votes for ESFP, and then I think we've got an ENFP from John Haxton, another ESFP, ESTP, ENFJ, ESFP, SE types, there we go, but we all have our shadow sides and dark places too. <laughs> and then, yeah. uh, just, and, and then uh, Ian was clarifying, waffle on is a technical Geordie phrase, which I don't know what every, every American's familiar with, which is just talk too much. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Ian can be the interpreter. <laughs> yeah. Lovely. Okay. Uh, right. The, I wanted to start with that. Just, it is a, a silly question because, um, and I think it, it, uh, it falls on from the session that we've just had from the back board um, about type being developmental, not diagnostic. And when we look at the type approach, we can't really ask this question and get a serious answer. We, but the tray approach that they often do, that, that often leads into coming up with who's happiest and why. And I think that's one of the strengths that we have with type that we can't really ask this question. What we would ask is, how can each type be happiest? So that's what we're gonna explore this afternoon. When I did look for research, I did do a lot of Googling of happiest type. And most of the serious attempts to answer that question were using the tray approach. One of the studies that's referenced here was a study of students. And in effect, it was the tray approach, but they came up with the ENFJs are likely to be the happiest. ENFJs with low anxiety. So, um, but as I say, I think it's a, it's a bit meaningless. So what we're gonna look at is how can each type be happy, happiest and how can we use the type approach with the people we work with to help make sure that they live a happy and fulfilled life. 
And I think someone from the Susan's comments, it depends how you define happiness. Well, I don't want to spend a load of time defining it. I th think one of the most useful definitions was from Martin Seligman and the idea of subjective well-being, because when he started the happiness movement and looking at happiness, at first it was it was accepted and then people start to think, oh, it's a bit glib, it's not very scientific. So it went out of favour a little bit. So moving on to subjective well-being, and that's basically a simple asking people for questions, which you can see on this slide. Um, so what we so I'm going to use that kind of definition. The reason I'm interested in happiness is when I work with young people, I mostly work with young people. And when I work with them, when I say, what is what do you want out of life? And they'll say it to be happy. And then you start to define what happy means to them. So that's what we're going to look at um, the in a broad sense. How can we live a, a happy life? And what Martin Seligman and the um, Action for Happiness movement in the UK and it's in other countries too, is um, it's to explore that broad area. Now, I'm going to start with the quote from Thoreau. Most people live lives of quiet desperation and go to the grave with their song still in them. And I really like that uh, quote. And and I think that sums up what we try to do. It's, it's helping people find their song. And that's what I want you to think about this for the next hour or so. What is your song? What are you meant to be singing and how are you meant to sing it? And I know, I think the quote is really referring to, in the last century, it was referring to people's work, exp the, their experience of the, a working life, that most people expected to have quite a tough, dull, career, um, whereas that has changed and it is changing, um, uh, has changed through the pandemic. And I know I've looked at some research recently on Generation Z and what they want out of life. And it seems to be changed and people don't want to settle for a life of quiet desperation. So it's up to us as careers or coaches and uh, people who use time to help, help use it so people can find their song. The three themes that I've tried to boil this down to, and these are things that uh, um, come th all through over and over again in any uh, in research that I've read, there are three key themes. One of them is presence, another is connection, and the third is meaning. And I'm going to explore those three with you uh, this afternoon and take you through some activities that help us delve into them in a little bit more detail. So we'll start off with the presence. And, and again, I'm going to start off with a, a few quotes that I, I've, I particularly enjoy when we talk about presence. I love the William Blake one to see a, a world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wild flower, hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. That encapsulates perfectly this idea of being present. And I also love the quote from Leo Buscaya, there is only the, this moment, the now. This doesn't we, mean we live for the moment, it means we live in the moment. A single rose can be my garden, a single friend, my world. And I think this gets to the heart of how important it is that we're able to, to be able to live in the moment. And that doesn't just mean in a everything's wonderful way. And the quote from uh, the film George, or at the end of the film, George or Rabbit, if you haven't seen it, it's definitely worth, worth a look. Let everything happen to you, beauty and terror. Just keep going. No feeling is final. And I think that uh, invites us to, end, to be in the moment and accept that we're going to experience. Happiness isn't just about having all the lovely things going on and it's not just about pleasure. It's about experiencing everything and accepting it. And a lot of Buddhism and a lot of approaches 
cover that, that as, an, uh, as a fundamental part of the belief system. So being able to live in the moment. So if we then turn to type. David, um, David, just a quick yeah. one. Your, your camera froze, so we'd love to see you keep moving. So I don't know if you want to just switch your camera off and switch it back on again, just so that we can see you rather than have just your your face frozen. It was an okay All face right. freeze, by the way, but just <laughs> yeah, much better than some, but just try it again. Sorry right, to interrupt. I'll, I'm just going to try and do that. I, I might not be able to do it. Um, I'm not sure how to do that, Susan. If I try and fiddle about too much, it might, it might all go wrong. You're on mute, Susan. It's um, when you look at stop video and start video, it should just that little camera on the bottom left of the screen, David. Move your mouse. Move your mouse. Yeah. <laughs> My mouse is now going crazy. Is it the three little dots at the end? No, it's, not, a, it's no. a camera because we're not seeing oh. you now. So you're not coming up. All right. Oh, yeah. Me. It's stop video. Yeah. That's it. There you go. Yeah. And then start. And I'll talk. OK, um, while I'm but, doing that, I'll give you the activity. It's quite uh, the activity is uh, I'm going to ask you to do a happy list. So what I'd like you to do is um, quickly write a list of all the things that you do that bring you happiness. OK, and it's best if you do this really quickly and you only have a minute. And I want you to come up with at least 10 if you can. These shouldn't be things that cause you or anyone else harm. I, that, that, that. Is that lead drinking out, David? Yes, that's basically why I've mentioned that because uh, I used to get alcohol coming up quite a lot. Um, it means you've drunk too much if your alcohol starts coming up. <laughs> right. Okay, so is that, has everybody got 10? Give David, another are, you, few... are you on a tablet or are you on an iPad? I can't write that fast. Yeah, let, give another 30 seconds, David, and right, try okay. and switch yeah, on. Your... I'm trying to um, start my video again and it doesn't want, it wants to let me. Are you on a laptop or uh, an iPad, David? A laptop. Okay, that should work then. It's, sometimes I... iPads are a bit weird. Yeah, Zoom. and give it a pause, David, because sometimes if you do two things close together, then it sort of negates. So just pause. Press okay. the, just press that, the white thing, not the arrow next to it, but the white thing, the white camera. Right. No, I'm... Right, I think I'm, uh, I'll move on and then I'll maybe have another go later on. And, uh, you, you just have to pretend that you can see me. Can you um, do it? Okay, so we've got um, the, 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 hopefully you've come up with some things on your happy list. What sorts of things have we got? I mean, um, I'll, I'll share some of the most common things that come up. One of them is taking the dog for a walk. Another is going out and experiencing um, something big like sunset or a sky or a sea or a mountain. That, that, that seems to be something that people enjoy experiencing. Um, I don't know if anything's coming through on the chat, Susan. Nothing at the moment. If you want to put your ideas into chat, that would be great. Okay. Generally speaking, when I've when I've shared this with um, with groups in the past, the answers are not things that um, are big, expensive, hard to to create. It's it's often very straightforward, simple things in life. They're the things that bring us most joy and happiness on a day to day basis. One thing we can do with your happy list is if you were to take any of those things that you could do more of in the next three weeks 
and then do more of those things, then you will be happier. Yeah, so you we, will increase your happiness. So we've got some uh, great lists here, watching nature, looking at the stars, going for a long run, nature hike, hugging my kids, walk on the beach and commune with friends, family, friends, being creative, music, time with family, sharing good food, tap dancing, Cindy, I know just took out, going for a walk, riding my horse, practical conversation. Here's uh, David, who's really stepping up. David Shaw, you said needed to talk, communicate. Here we are. Practical conversation, work, eat a sandwich outdoors, walk, be in forest, sing, laugh, enjoy view, help others, listen to others, eat great food, meditation, prayer, read, learn. Wow. Being with family, meditation, gardening, uh, chugging yeah. on a narrow boat through a tree line cutting. Yes, Chris, wish we were there with you again. <laughs> Developing others, Sounds from the past, vinyl records, feeling like I helped someone, speaking to good friends, experiencing something new. Thank you, John. Uh, Haxton, yet yeah, learning, reading, Tai Chi from Judy McLaren, sunshine, reading, sitting by the sea with crashing waves, doing something spontaneous, painting. It's a really interesting yeah. look at this chat combined with types is really interesting to look at. Wow, we've got tons. Oh, my goodness. I couldn't read yeah, them all. Great. OK, um, so. <laughs> Um, just to sum up, and what I'm going to, um, so we can do, if we can do more of any of those in the next few weeks, we can be happier, we can actually increase our happiness. Another thing you can do is when you look down your list, are there other people involved in any of the activities? And if there are, um, that's a clue as to the people who are important in your life. They're the people that contribute most to your happiness. So they're the people you need to look after and care for. And often when I ask people to look at the list of the, the, the names of the people, they're the ones we're meanest to. <laughs> well, we don't, not intentionally, but they're the people that are most important, we often aren't the nicest to. We're nicer to complete strangers. I'm not saying we shouldn't be nice to complete strangers, but it's a bit of an odd way to, to set up our lives. Um, okay. Ian, Jen Ian Jenner asked a great question. He said, what if they're not on our list? Right, OK. <laughs> right, well, then if, if it's someone that's really important to you, then I think you need to get them on your list. So <laughs> think of things that you can do with that person that are gonna, it's gonna bring happiness to both of you. Um, as an example, when I, um, I did my happy list and then I asked my wife to do her happy list and there was something that appeared on both of our lists and it was something we did about once a week um, and it was, we went for a scone and a cup of tea at the weekend. Yes, I live the rock and roll lifestyle, I do. Um, and it was quite interesting to think, ah, actually, this is something we both enjoy. And then when we were, next time we did that together, we were able to actually be present and think this is something really important. This is you, we're enjoying this. Then there were things on, on her list that weren't on mine. One of the things on her list was going to get a, her hair cut which she does about once a month or did do once a month. Um, uh, sadly, not for a while now. And I thought, oh, I don't like getting my hair cut. But then I said, why do you like getting your hair cut? And she went into a long answer. Oh, it's lovely. I'll enjoy the whole day. I, and the way she described it, I thought, oh, that's fantastic. Uh, I can say that. So I would say to Ian, have a conversation with the people that are important to you and make sure you you have those activities i know i did this about 10 or 12 years ago when, with my children I, um i thought i must do an activity because i have a boy and a girl and there's three or four years between them I thought is it an activity the three of us can do together and it was quite difficult to find something but we did karate and uh, for a, and we did it for a few months and then and then they said to me dad you're so bad at this you're embarrassing us. So can we stop going to karate or will you stop going? Um, but um, so I think this is something we all need to do. We need to uh, get these activities um, uh, that link us to the people who are important. Now I did say to Susan, be careful in case anybody uh, goes off on a tangent and it's me that's gone off on one. So I do <laughs> apologize. Um, but the, the question I was going to ask was then, how, how, do the, how do those things on your list relate to type? 
do they relate to type? Do they relate to your preferences, the stereotypes that, that go with you, either your preferences or your interaction style or your temperament? To what extent can we help people find out what makes them happy based on their personality preferences? Now, because of time, I'm conscious of time, and I really want to cover at least the three things for happiness. I'm going to ask for us not to spend too long on this. I'm just going to give it as a question to you. Go back and have a look at your preferences um, and see where there is a, 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 a link. My own, from going through this activity a few times myself, my th thought is that actually we may spend more time doing the things that fit our personality preferences, but actually to be fully content and present, we need to do everything. We need a little bit of everything uh, to be fully happy. That, that's my, my inclination as what the answer is, but it would be great to get your thoughts on that. So if anyone has any thoughts on that, whether you agree or disagree, please put them in the chat function and then we can, we can have a look later. Okay, so with your permission, I'm gonna move on. I did want to mention just in passing the hero's journey. I do think this is a really interesting conversation to have with, with people that we're working with that we're coaching or, or, or counselling or, or building teams. The, and, uh, in a nutshell, if you're not familiar with the model, it's Joseph Campbell's hero's journey suggests that we, everyone's life goes through the ba same basic pattern. First of all, we're, we're, we're young uh, and we're called to go on an adventure by a mentor, a teacher or an adult who says to us, you are special, you can do great things. And we doubt the mentor. We say, no, no, not me. I'm not great. I'm just me. Um, and then they have to ask us again. And then eventually we cross the threshold and we go on an adventure in life and we test ourselves, we build skill and experience. And what I, as I go through this, I think personality type model is a fantastic way to help people through each of these steps. Um, wherever they are in their hero's journey, type is a fantastic way of helping them guide them through that and understand where they're at and what they need to do next. So the next step, you can see from the maze, we have tests. Um, and I think the tests are mostly about us building self-belief, not really about the skills we develop. And I think that's true of life. And I think that's where education sometimes gets it wrong. It focuses on the tests and not the main purpose of the test, which is to help someone build a sense of who they are and what their contribution can be in the world. Their song, in effect, finding their song. And then when they, the, the, the next step in the hero's journey is we have a, we have to slay the dragon. We have to face a challenge that we think is too big for us, but actually we succeed. And once we succeed, we then feel fuller and more complete and aware of our real power. And then what we do is we take that power back to the world to help others. It's a, it's a lovely model. Um, and I often find it's really, personality type is a great way to help guide people around that process. So I wanted to share that with you. Um, we've not got time, but I could ask, think of type and how it helps at each of those steps. So the next big theme is connection. We need to connect with others. We're not an island, that kind of idea. And if we're using the sing your song metaphor, I might stretch this metaphor a little bit too far, but are you in a band? If you are hopefully not Oasis, perhaps, but if you're in a band, maybe you're not in a band, maybe you're Ed Sheeran, maybe you're a solo performer. But even if you are, I think you would need to connect with your audience. So there's, so we do have to connect, but there are different ways we can connect. And certain, I think, different types 
like to connect in different ways. And then they're not better or worse, but they are different. So as a, as a quick summary of connection, and I think this is something that through COVID, we've heard more about and people have experienced more of this. So we have, first we have to connect to ourself. We need self-awareness. We need to know who we are and we need to accept who we are. And I again, to what extent can we use personality type to help people with, with, in that process? And I think a great deal. It's fantastic for helping people build self-awareness and as a developmental process. Also, we have to connect to others and that's with relationships. We need to, we need to care and to be cared for. And I think this is a fundamental need of, of the, uh, for us as humans. I could quote research um, where they've tested, uh, done tests on mice. Mice seem to be the ones that get it, where they, you know, they, they'll burn mice and then see how, how quickly their burns heal. And when they put mice, leave mice alone, they, they don't heal very quickly. When they're with other mice, they heal more quickly. And it's to do with oxytocin, but it's to do with connection. We're social creatures. We need to be around others. We can answer that in a scientific way or in a poetic way. Um, but the, the underlying idea permeates so many approaches to what a meaningful life or, or a connected life is and it, as part of happiness. Also, we need to connect uh, the Dunbar number, by the way, is research from a, someone who looked at how many people do we need to connect to? How many friends can we have? And the Professor Dunbar from Dundee University came up with the idea that we can only have a maximum of, of 140 meaningful relationships. I don't know whether you would agree with that. Um, do you feel you have more than that? How many meaningful relationships do you think you have in your life? Uh, this is something I often share with young people because they, they think if we forever seeking um, clicks on social media for friends and likes, it becomes meaningless. Um, I think 144 sounds quite high to me, even for my wife, she's an ASFJ, so she's got loads of uh, contacts, but I reckon within it, the, the Dunbar also looks at within that 140, there's probably enough time for us to have meaningful relationships with about 30 people. Um, I don't know what, what your score is, your number, it's not right or wrong, but we can have meaningful interactions with about 30 people. Um, okay, then we need to connect with the, to the world, the, uh, the universe, the environment. We've seen that a lot in COVID, and when you look back to your happy list, you probably, uh, I, I, I recognize a lot of those examples were coming through of being able to connect to um, our environment in one way or another. And when it, it's, to, to one of this, this comes to something that I, with the research around Generation Z, which is you're basically pe people now in their twenties, and they now seek experiences rather than consumption. There's been a shift towards experiences rather than consuming products. And as a bit of a hippie myself, I'm all I've well done to the 20 somethings for, for going in that direction. I, I fully uh, concur with that conclusion. And it's it links to the um, the hedonistic treadmill, the idea that if we're just forever seeking the next dopamine hit or buy the next product, then it's a, we just acclimatize to whatever it is we've, we've bought and we get bored of it and we have to then seek and the, 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 late, the, the next update. And there's also a, an interesting concept in marketing of, um, of building in planned obsolescence so they'll build in how long they want a product to be cool for and it used to be five to ten years whereas with phones they're trying to get it down to six months or so 
before people are supposed to feel ashamed of their phone and buy the next one. So hopefully, um, people, the, 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 new, the, the younger people are now saying that life is more about these experiences. And it's to do with how do we link to connect with the world, the environment, the universe. For some people that's through religion, for some people it's not, but it's to do with being aware that there's more in this world than, than us. I really like the quote. I, I can't rem remember where I heard it, but it, this was almost in um, uh, to answer people like Boris Johnson and uh, Matt Hancock through the COVID in the UK, the politicians saying we're all in this together. And actually, we there was a feeling that we're not all in this together. And they, they would say we're all in the same boat. And I like the idea that we're not all in the same boat, but we're all in this we're, we're all in the same storm. We're in different boats in the same storm and we don't know whose boat's gonna get into trouble. So we need to all look after each other um, because you don't know who might be able to help help you. I love that idea. And I even noticed the politicians, some of us talking in an earlier session about the power of words. They used to talk about science. We were gonna have a world beating science and tech industry in the UK. And they don't say that now, it's not world bidding. They now are saying, we're gonna have a world assisting science and tech industry. And I, I, I think that's a lovely shift to so a better way of thinking. Okay, and I wanted to share with you just a couple of examples of how I've been able to, 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 to um, I've now not got, I don't know if Susan's still there. I am, yes. Yeah, okay, good. Um, if there are any comments or thoughts, do, do uh, chip in. Um, I wanted to share just some of the work I've been doing in schools in the last few months. And this is to help year nine students of 13, 14 year olds. They're coming back into school and they, what on earth can we do to help them? And the teachers have said, they're, you know, a lot of them, they're just like rabbits in a headlight. They're, they really need some help. So one of the things that I've been doing with you, the, the young people is been looking at taking them through, uh, finding out their personality preferences, and then looking at temperament and just saying, to what extent do you agree with these are the strengths that you might have that you might be able to bring back into school? So for example, the guardians, I say, to what extent do you agree that your strengths are hardworking, determination, diligence, focus? And you know, mostly they'll say, yeah, yeah, they are my strengths. So we can look, how are you gonna bring them into school to help not just yourself thrive, but to help your peers? And they found that, so they, they, uh, what I'm sharing with you here is how I try to use type as a developmental, process to help people understand themselves better and help others too. And then the other area I've looked at with them is, let's look at what, how we would predict um, stress, stress, you know, uh, how, how you might be experiencing stress during COVID and lockdown. So when I've asked the guardians, um, the SJs, what, is this what stresses you out? Is it the uncertainty, the not being able to stick to your plans? And generally they say, yes, that sounds about right. So we can then come up with strategies for them to help them cope. So I say to them, have, if you like your to-do lists, have a to-do list of things you can influence. And on the other list, the things that you can't influence at the moment. And then just concentrate on the to-do list where you can have some influence and control and we've had some really nice I've had really nice feedback from schools that young people are able to move forward in these difficult times uh, by understanding their their temp you know but uh, with a, a basic but powerful understanding of, of how their temperament I don't use the jargon and, and talk about it in those ways but they're, they're getting an experience of some of how, why, why I love the personality type so much. So how can you help yourself and your friends and the school community? And the teachers have been applying it as well. 
I'll not go through all of them, but you, you get the idea that we can start to help people um, as they go back into school and cope with change. And uh, Jane Kesey added, uh, you know, even with adult guardian teachers knowing they're wired to be stressed by uncertainty makes them more comfortable with uncertainty. So she really likes that work. And Chris talked about make for uh, NFs or idealists to make a to be list rather than a to do list. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I got really good resonance from the young people, the idealists, when I said that uh, what seem what you know, does th is this what stresses you out? taking on the world's problems as your own and, and feeling that there isn't a positive future. Okay, yeah, and a lot, I got a lot of really interesting comments about that. Yes, um, and so again, we can then look at, well, what can you do about that? And the kind deeds, doing small act, random acts of kindness and things like that. And that's what kept me going through a lot of the pandemic. When we would see on the news examples of people doing amazing things, not just Captain Tom, but people that were just being selfless and, and helping the community. It was just, that really helped me as an idealist. So it's, uh, so yes, I, I think it was, a, it's been really nice to be able to use type that model in a, in a positive way. Okay, um, I'm gonna move on to the, the third big chunk of, um, of this happiness triangle uh, and it's meaning and purpose. And again, what we could read lo a lot of research and ideas that, that, that show how important it is that we need a life of meaning. We need a purpose in our life to be happy. Um, I, I love Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning, you know, the, the, uh, but there are, there are so many different examples of this. This always seems to come down as something that's crucial and important. So my question would be, um, if finding meaning and purpose is so important, how can we use the type model to explore this? So I want, want, to, want to give you another activity here. What I'm gonna ask you to do is to think of three people that you admire. Name three people that you admire. You don't have to think too long and hard about it. As long as they're people you genuinely admire, it, this will work. And just so you can see, my th the three that I chose when I did the, put this together a few weeks ago was Stephen Fry, Paul Merton, and Mary Beard. And if you if you're in an, an international audience, you may not know who these people are. Some of these people are, but that doesn't matter. So pick three people that you admire. I hope you've had a chance to do that. If you wanted to do this activity uh, over, a, you know, take a bit longer over it, because it really takes about 20 minutes to do this activity. But um, I'll give you a flavour of this. Based David, on, David, just a yeah. quick question. Does it have to be uh, anonymous or celebrities as we know them? Or can it be people we've worked with? Can it be past, present? When yeah, it can be list. anybody. Yeah, yeah. Go with the three people that come to straight to the first come to mind are usually the best ones. And when I do this with young people, they often want to pick um, people who aren't celebrities. They want to pick family members. Um, yeah. Uh, so, so absolutely, you you choose people who mean something to you that you people that you admire and that's one of the nice things about covid where the people we look up to and again young people are now looking up less to celebrities and more to real people people nurses care assistants and uh, you know people who work in shops people who collect uh, the uh, our rubbish they they get they they they've been more acknowledged now for the, uh, the, the input that they, they have, uh, which is <clears throat> a good thing. So I, I'm hoping you've picked a few people. And then what I'm gonna ask you to do is to choose each pair. Um, so make, each, make them a pair, make, pick a pair, and then identify something that they both have in common. So for example, if I cho choose Stephen Fry and Mary Beard, 
and think, is there something, what, what is, is, is there something that I admire about both of them? What is there something they have in common? So I could give the example of they're intelligent and they're experts. Their intelligence and their expertise is something I admire about both of them. David, do you mind for the international audience, just if people aren't familiar with them, just giving a quick overview of their three sort of roles? Yeah, so S Stephen Fry, um, oh, um, he's a, an actor, comedian, writer, thinker. He's, um, he's very well read. He's uh, Cambridge, uh, but uh, modest with it. Um, Mary Bird, she's a, a, a classical a classicist. She has done a, a number of TV programs. She got a lot of criticism because she doesn't, uh, if you saw the picture, she has gray hair and she's a woman. <gasps> How dare she uh, be a TV presenter? But she's absolutely fantastic. And she brushed off the criticism she had really well. Um, and Paul Merton, he's a comedian who's had a very long career. Um, um, so what we what we would do is we take something they have in common. So that would be the, what links Stephen Fry, and Mary Bird, intelligence, expertise. What links Stephen Fry and Paul Merton from me is their humour, but they use humour with a positive intent. It's to prick, prick pomposity, to reveal human truths. Um, nice thing Stephen Fry said was we are verbs think of us think of life as we we are verbs we are not nouns that well, I was reminded of that in a, an, a, an earlier session um, and then something I admire about Paul Merton and Mary Bates so with three people you get three combinations and with Paul Merton and Mary Bates it's their dedication to their field of interest they really put in the work. They, they, they get to know their subject as well as they can. So what we do with these, when you, you know, maybe you've been having a go at this and are you surprised at, at any of the answers that have come up? Um, what this usually reveals is the qualities that you want to live your life by. This is a way to, um, to, to, to try and help the people we work with start to understand what their song is and how they're gonna sing their song and who they're gonna sing it with, yeah? So this is, this is a, a lovely activity to help explore that. Um, so I hope you're able to try this out. If not, finish it now, maybe have a, have a go um, a bit later and see what comes up. And it, um, um, it very rarely doesn't impress people with how it gets to their own truth, their own song. Okay, the next thing we can do with this um, is one thing in terms of the research around happiness and some of Martin Seligman's work, which I think is fantastic. He has, his, his one of the things, pieces of research he did was he looked throughout human history at what are the qualities that every society admires about people within its culture. And he came up with six key, key themes and virtues, character virtues. And you can see them written there, wisdom, courage, humanity, and so on. And he subdivided them into 24 characteristics. These are the things that we admire in humans. These are the things that allow us to build a meaningful life. Which of those you, would you like to build your life around? Which of those 24 things? Which of them link to the activity you've just done with the three people that you admire? Um, I, mean, I once did this with some teachers and one teacher, I said, which of these would you like to use to build your life around. And he said, all 20, uh, all 24. And I said, are you able to express all 24 well? And he said, yes. And I thought that was a bit ambitious. I think two or three is, a, is about the right number. But I, he said he, he, he was good at all 24 of these. So I did wonder about the, the example of humility, whether, whether he was perhaps not being 
uh, as good at that one as he thought. But yeah, so the, another way we can look at this, um, what I find uh, really useful with uh, temperament is that's a good way to get at this meaning and purpose in life. And I don't know whether you would agree with this, but usually I find temperament a really good level to go in at uh, to help start to have the conversation with people about what's gonna be a meaningful life for them. And this is a quick, a very brief summary of the, of the temperaments and what may bring meaning to, to them. And I do find that usually people do, these do resonate with people when, when you show them. And sometimes I show them these without the, the, the label, without telling them which, which is which temperament and saying, which of these are you attracted to? And it's usually the one that, that fits, fits their personality preferences. Not always, but usually. Okay. I'm happy for any, but if anyone wants to chip in with, uh, with, uh, with any comments or thoughts, then please do. So you could please. raise hands or put your ideas into chat. I just think it would be nice for someone else to talk for at least a minute other than me. <laughs> no? Okay. Uh, well, I'll, I'll talk for a bit more then. Um, so another, uh, if we look at um, another way of looking at perhaps trying to find, how do we find meaning in our life? We can use, um, I, I like the idea of looking at all the different ways people have, have, have used the, the model to start to give us a chance to, uh, to try different ways of helping people, to help them understand themselves and where they are in their life. So with interaction styles, um, when you look at your own interaction style, what, what do you, do you think that, that is when, when you're at your happiest, when you find, you, you're you almost likely to find meaning and purpose in life when you're using your interaction style? I mean, looking at that one, David, often the the drive for get things going is an embraced result but in charge it's the attainable result which would link with your achievement chart the course is the desired results and behind the scene is the best result possible so achieving those res that type of result would probably give some sort of satisfaction or meaning mm -hmm. right thank you for that susan and yeah so what, what I've been looking to explore um, is how we can use different ways of using the, the, all, all of the work that's out there around personality type and how we can help people find a meaningful, you know, a happy life uh, across those three themes. Now, what I'm going to do now is just give you a chance to, I'm gonna share, take you through some of the other resources that I'm just gonna pin, highlight these so that if any of them that you are particularly interested in, you could maybe have a look at later on. I mean, I do wonder, um, David, if it's worth just for right now, just to, so that we try one more time to see you to come off sharing your slides, which might encourage people to communicate with you a bit more and just, and then just try your camera again and then put yeah. your slides back up just to see if, because we'd yeah. love to be able to see you. I know I, I, I'm really struggling. When I put the pop up and click start video, I'm clicking start video and it just doesn't want to let me start. Do you want to try just stopping sharing your slides for a minute? Just see if that makes a difference and see if- Okay. David, yes, were, David, were you in one of the uh, the bars before, one of those meeting rooms in the in the break? Um, no, I wasn't. There. I've gone onto a different laptop. Okay, because so, sometimes those windows stay open and stop. That happened to me yeah. yesterday. Yeah, Kumo space blocks it, doesn't it? Because yeah. your camera's in Kumo space. And we don't seem to have got you back, David. I'm sorry. Right. Okay. I'm going to try. I'll try again. We are seeing your slide back now, though. So, 
but not you. <laughs> and you need to unmute now because you're unmute. Unmuted. Yes, I've there unmuted. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I, maybe it's karma getting me back for not putting my screen on in some of the earlier sessions, which I know is <laughs> naughty. Um, okay, uh, right. I do. I'm sorry about that. You, I, I may as well um, share some of the other information. Uh, I'd like to point you in the direction, if you're not aware of the work of Sean Aker, who looks at happiness in reverse. He, his idea in education is that we say to children, work hard at school and you'll get good grades. And if you get good grades, you'll, you'll go to university. And if you go to university, you'll get a good job. And if you get a good job, you'll be happy. And he says that that's, there are children that are going to fall away at every step of that L lots of children work hard but don't get good grades and so on and so on he suggests that we go in the opposite direction that we start at the end with the intention of being happy and work backwards and if i think of that i'll give a personal example when i've done it backwards it's it's a better result so if you start with the intention of being happy and say, right, what makes me happy? What, what are the, you know, in terms of work tasks? Um, and then you go and do those work tasks. Then you, you're enjoying your work. So when I was self-employed, you know, as a self-employed person, I can choose the work tasks that make me happy, um, the things I enjoy, the people I enjoy working with. Then, then, because you're enjoying it, you work hard at it and you, you, you do qualifications and you try to become as expert as you possibly can. Um, so you then end up going backwards through the, the, the rather than forwards. So start with the, in, with the uh, intention of being happy and work backwards. Uh, I, and it, he's got some, he's written some books on this. There are some good TED talks where he takes you through this model. And I think it's a really interesting approach and it fits in with uh, what I was saying earlier about Generation Z. Can you just go back? Because um, uh, Jerry shared that uh, Sean Aker, it's the happiness advantage, if you just pop back. And then John Haxton says, what do people feel about national or local targets for happiness, happiness quotients, gross national happiness, etc." Anyone like to chip in on that as a, uh, possible. What do people feel about national, local targets for happiness, happiness quotients, etc.? Any thoughts? If you raise your hands, that does bring you up to the the top, and I can see you. Absolutely good. What do you think of them, John? Sorry, just found my unmute button. Um, I think they're a nice idea, but as implemented, a bit ropey. Yeah. Uh, Okay, I mean, I would concur with that. I think because you often hear Norway or Scandinavia are the happiest places, and I think it becomes a bit meaningless. It's a bit like saying people at metropolitan places, people are more extrovert than uh, rural places, and it just becomes meaningless. Well, um, I think type is about working with individuals at that level and helping them understand themselves and how they're going to react. But on the other hand, the GDPR is also meaningless because in every country it's based on different stuff, but people are still using it across the world. Yeah. So it's a better meaningless measure than the one we've got. Right. And uh, Paula talked about there's a whole field of happiness economics that's interesting, although I only know a smidge about it. And Jerry talks about happiness is not something to be achieved by focusing on it. It's a byproduct of satisfaction, perhaps of using our preferences to be the best. Gosh, we're getting lots of comments in chat now. And Jane Kesey talks about is happiness or fulfillment the real goal if I'm measuring something versus resetting my own activities in life. It makes urban planning more interesting. Thank you, Mark. Um, and ha happiness and contentment, David Shaw says, are often confused rather unhelpfully. How about, and uh, David Paul, how about the notion of deeply experiencing a full range of emotions versus maybe overvaluing happiness? How about authentic experience of the flow of life? Yeah, so, that's good. Yeah, I, I hope I've um, 
um, not contradicted any of those comments. It's uh, I've split it into three things and the living in the moment and not just chasing pleasure. Um, and it's it's the climb to the top of the mountain, not the summit, reaching the summit that's important. And then it's also by, by finding the meaning and the connection. So I, I hope that fits, fits in. Um, I did promise in the um, description of the session that I would talk about the, the seven things that Martin Seligman have, I, has identified. And he, he uses the PERMA model. And you can see from that, so th this will be a slide that's available to you. Um, and I think it fits in with the, you know, the, the, the three that I've talked about. And these are his seven. Um, and again, it fits with the comments, Susan, that you've read out as well mm -hmm. from the chat mm -hmm. function. I think they're all part of this. And Martin Sullivan's pains to, 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 to say that for, for different people, there's different amounts of, of these, the, each of these elements that, that are gonna be important to them. It's, it's not one formula. And John Haxton says the M MBTI co-research is based on the PERMA model. Thank you, John. Yeah, but um, I've, yeah, I'm, I'm, let's see, I think, let's see, yeah, I think we'll, um, I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to finish with this slide, and this was just five things that you, you could do next after this session finishes to increase your happiness. He, here are things that um, have been pretty well researched uh, that, that do seem to have a really powerful impact on our uh, subjective well-being. And I'll, I'll, right, I'll just finish actually with here are five things you could do after this session finishes. And one of them there is have a new experience. So that might include going to another session uh, in the, at the BAP conference. Okay, so I'm gonna um, wrap up there. Uh, if anyone wants to uh, say anything or Susan, if, you, if there are any other comments, then I'm happy to take them. And I'm happy to hang around for a little while in case anyone wants to uh, to ask further questions on anything that I've talked about. And as David said, we will be sharing the slides afterwards. And there are some, as you know, some great activities on there that maybe if you didn't have time to complete in the session, something really useful to do afterwards. I particularly liked actually the happiness list with your partner. I thought that was a really, so you'll like to do get happiness for different reasons. So you will get a copy of the slides. We'll keep the um, uh, this Zoom link open for a little while longer if you want to stay and we'll try again, see if we can get David on, on camera. If, if not, uh, or are there other quick questions for before we sort of, I'll stop recording and leave the, the questions. We're getting great stuff. Thanks, David. Many thanks. Lots of things to consider. Really interesting session. Ganin Kani from <laughs> Axton. <laughs> and uh, great. And Alan Duncan says thanks. Great to spend some time considering this in more detail. And thanks for the materials to try or read later. As uh, David said to me before we started, we've got about a day's worth of content here. So I just want to give David a big thank you for all the time he put into preparing this. So if you want to stop sharing slides now, and we'll leave it open for discussion. That would be great. So just stop sharing, David, and that, that way at least we'll, you'll be able to see the people who are left in case they have questions. Yeah. Perfect. You just need to stop sharing your slide. And I'm going to, there, uh, I'm going to, there we go, put it back. I'm going to pause, I'm going to stop recording now. <laughs>